Good afternoon, everyone. How are you doing? Good. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming out. If I wasn't standing up here, I would be sitting where all of you are right now because, I mean, there are very few words to describe like the kind of work Carrie Coon has put onto the screen in just the last few years. Um, between Fargo and The Leftovers and Gone Girl. So without further ado, please give the warmest round of applause to Carrie Coon. Okay. Love it. Thank you so much for being here today. Oh my gosh, thank you for having me. It's so flattering. Congratulations on Fargo and The Leftovers and all the things. Yeah, I'm spo I'm retiring now. It's out. Now I'm done. This is I'm her done. swan song today. Yeah. You are all thank there Thank you for, for being it. here. I'm here to announce my retirement. <laughs> well, even if you did, we'd be left with so much wonderful stuff. I might go out when I'm ahead then. That's right. It's like this, like uh, George Costanza said, just like leave them wanting more and just be out. But don't do that. Um, I want to start with Fargo, which they just watched. The new season is so great. And, I, you know, I know that Noah, the showrunner, is very secretive man. You know, he's not someone who's sort of very forthcoming with what's happening on a show. When you were approached for it, I mean, what kind of things were you told about what this would be? Well, that's so interesting because I think of Damon as being so much more secretive than Noah. You tend to work with I, se super secretive Noah. geniuses. Is my <laughs> I married one too. Um, I think you know I actually knew about that. What the character was the sheriff. I knew that, and our conversation was actually more about physics. When I had my first meeting with Noah, he had this whole metaphor for the season, and some of the stuff unfortunately doesn't make it into the episode because we run out of time. But there was supposed to be this whole subplot with a, a physicist who's building a machine in the parking lot of the. I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about this. Oh my Definitely goodness! Keep Just, you about all have to die. <laughs> um, and and it's about how there's a, a certain kind of electron that doesn't exist unless it runs into something else. And and I think it was really a metaphor for what Gloria is experiencing. She feels invisible. And then also her relationship with um, Winnie Lopez, who you meet in 304, because it's such a messy human interaction that she doesn't really want to engage with. It's so messy. But it's the only thing that keeps her feeling real and alive. And so it required her to bump up against somebody like that. So that was what we talked about. And then I promptly received, I think, four, I think I had four or five scripts before we started. Maybe three, maybe I'm exaggerating. But in leftovers, we we ever we only ever got them a day. I mean, day two b days before we shot them, which is crazy. So I was I couldn't believe I was looking at five scripts before I started a project. It was insane. Um, I'm curious, you know, as an actor, when a creator tells you something like the idea of electrons bumping into mm -hmm. each other, I mean, is that the kind of thing you just cling to in building your person? I mean, look, it would be very highfalutin of me to say that Gloria Burgle comes out of a you know physics lesson. But I am a nerd. I'm a super nerd. I love research. I love reading books. Um, if somebody recommends a book to me about you know preparing for something, I'll always read it. That used to be the only way I prepared. But it was interesting because Fargo was so different because in, in many ways, Fargo is very outside in because you have um, you have the the dialect, and then you put on a big puffy coat and you put on a stiff police uniform and a 15 pound belt that I call the hip chafer. And then you put on these boots that are like living rooms. And so you walk differently. And so you're already part of the way there when you just put on all the clothes. And then you have this writing that's really specific. And so all the information you need is on the page, right? And so in, in fact, if you showed up and said everything in a, close to that dialect, you're probably gonna be okay because the writing is so good. Um, hopefully you do a little better than that. Some days I, I didn't, <laughs> but I was like, thank goodness for all these things. Um, so what was the question? You got it. No, we got okay. there. We got yeah, there. I forgot. I was well, rambling. No. I forgot. Well, speaking of, we got a lot of questions from the audience uh, about the accent. Oh, and okay. Sort of uh, how did you struggle with it? What did you have to do? Do you have to stay in it all day? Guys, I'm from Ohio. <laughs> my people, I, when I went to grad school, I realized that my family kind of sounded like pirates. So I was like, what do you mean the hard R? I don't have a hard R. You know, it was like this kind of thing. I was learning about my people. But I went to graduate school at UW-Madison UW in Wisconsin. So that dialect is not far. So I would come home and be like, hey, are we going out to the store, mom? You know, are we going home? And they were like, home? What's home? You know, they were making fun of my dialect when I was in grad school already. So it wasn't far. I, was, I always tell this anecdote, but I was in a shoe store in Wisconsin. And am I holding this too close to my mouth? You're doing great. Okay. <laughs> I feel like a little present for you right now. Um, I was in a shoe store, and this woman goes, oh, for cute. 
And she was talking about a shoe, right? And I was just like, what? I mean, they really talk like that. They, I mean, we. So no, it wasn't hard. I love, but I have to say, I also have a very personal, I love that kind of work so much. I, when, I was in gra uh, when I was in undergrad, I was an English and Spanish major, and my, my uh, thesis was about language acquisition. I thought I was gonna be a linguist, which now, after I read the Jeffrey Eugenides book, The Marriage Plot, I realized my whole life is a cliche, but that's a whole other SAG Q&A, we can go into that later. Um, <laughs> And so I, I learned IPA in grad school, the International Phonetic Alphabet, right? And I love that stuff. So basically you, you get to notate those vowel shifts. So I love to go through and sort of note what those shifts are and, and I have a very visual way because you know those are symbols. So, so I work on those things very methodically with the IPA and I love the IPA and I, when I hear students in drama school not being taught that, I just like think if you don't have a good ear for accents, how are you ever gonna learn one? Because it's such an important tool you can break down anything with IPA. So that's my nerdy secret. Well, we're gonna, let's lean into this nerddom because I wanna know when you were building Gloria, I mean, what were the things, you talked about research, you talked about language. I mean, what sort of things did you invent for her so she felt real to you at the start of this? You know, it's so, there was, there was so much information contained in that script. We know so much about the circumstances of her life currently that really it was the most outside in preparation I've ever had. This is the first time where I didn't actually go read a bunch of things. There's a great book though called, I think it's just called, is it called Cops? Like Chicago Cops or something, which is a hilarious book. It's just transcribed interviews with cops from Chicago, which is really interesting. Really has nothing to do with Gloria at all, but but the cop mentality was really fascinating. Um, I was prepping for that because I did a movie where I played an FBI agent, but anyway. So I didn't do a lot of stuff for her because she's so much like the women I, that are in my family. There's a kind of stoicism about her, this sort of will handle it, that bad things don't happen to good people, you know, all this, this kind of attitude that's very much a part of the Midwest and her particular kind of repression, which is the thing I escaped when I left Ohio. So she's very much, you know, she was very familiar to me and I didn't feel like I had to do, th the first day you do the dialect is always weird. You sound, you feel like you sound like a cartoon, <laughs> right? And then you realize you settle into it. I think Ewan was saying in a Q&A, he finally got it by the last episode, you know, and you're just like, oh, that's, okay, now we're done. And we're done. Yeah. Well, I mean, was that a 180 degree difference from building Nora on The Leftovers or was she someone you also felt you had touchstones for? Yeah, I mean, they're all, they're all me, right? So it's, it can't be that different. But Nora was certainly more inside out because, well, there's the book, which I had read previous to it being made into a television show because I was a fan of Tom's anyway. And so I really did relate to Nora in the book. And she's actually not in the book that much. I wanted for more of her. And then um, I've talked about this resource as well. You know, the, there's a book called Wave by Sonali Darya Nagala who lost her family in the tsunami. And she lost her two children, her husband, both of her parents, her best friend's parents. I mean, everybody like that. And that's the closest equivalent I've ever found to Nora Durst. And I don't have children yet, and I, I'm married, but that's, it's unfathomable to me. I, I know people that have kids can't even talk about something happening to their kids. They can't even talk about it. They have to sort of stop the conversation, right? And I never wanted to, that to feel not real or trite. And so her book became this thing I carried around with me for three years when I was playing Nora because you could open to any passage and be completely struck by how incisive and um, she was just brutal writing about her grief because she was an economist, she's not a writer. So she writes like an economist. It's the most spare expression and it's not very thick. And there are just so many images from that book that seemed perfect and evocative. And so that was kind of my touchstone all, th all three years. And then otherwise you just kind of, you know, stand and deliver with somebody like that. And she taught me about you know, Nora's very different in terms of how she doesn't suffer fools and she defends herself in a room. And I learned a lot about just standing up straight and even my voice actually kind of, I did a play in between seasons and even my voice dropped in a little bit because um, of some vocal work I was doing, which was much more Nora than me. And my, so my voice is even sitting lower now for having done leftovers. It's weird. It's great. Well, I mean, in talking about things that can stay with you, I mean, that is extremely heavy material. Yeah. I mean, did you find that during production or after you were, things were sticking to you in a way you didn't? That's funny. I mean, I think when, as an artist, when you're working on something, it does change your filter so you hear the world differently. But I don't necessarily believe as an actor you have to take that stuff home. Now, when you're hearing the world differently, you're taking that home with you wherever you go. But I find, 
I'm of the mind that actors are healthier than most people because I get to scream and throw things and roll down a hill. I mean, I get to do all that stuff at work. And so I'm acting, by the end of the day, you're like, ah, that was fulfilling. I, there's a story, you know, Tom Parada came to set one day. He's such a wonderful person to have on set because he's so generous and he knows that this is not his book anymore. And he loves actors and he's just really kind about all of it. And I had this, you know, weeping. I'm a woman, I'm an actress, we weep a lot. I had this weeping scene, you know, that I had to do. I can't remember when it was. It might have been season one. And I came off the set and it was the end of the day. And I said, okay, Tom, it was great to see you. I'll see you tomorrow. And he just looked at me like I had just run over his dog. And he said... Just like that? You can drop it just like that? And I said, I said, honey, I've been doing that. I've been doing that for an hour and a half. I'm done. Like I'm <laughs> done doing that. I need to go home and, you know, have a sandwich. But he was so sweet because but I just think I actually think like I am much more fully expressed than any of my siblings, you know, because of my job. So I, I don't know, I think it's really healthy. Yeah. I mean I can completely understand that. Um, I want to take a step back now and I'm curious, you know, because you've had these roles in the last five years that for a lot of people starting with um you know your who's afraid of virginia wolf work that felt like it really m put you on people's radar in a way you weren't before but i think as anyone in this room would attest there's no such thing as overnight success frankly there's always a lot of work and preparation that goes into that and there's years of you know jobs that you don't want anyone to see um so i mean for you where did this love of acting begin how old were you when you realized this was something you wanted to do well, I remember going to a play at the Akron Civic Theater, which is a beautiful atmospheric theater in Ohio. Um, and we were seeing Babes in Toyland. I don't even know if that's a thing. It's a Christmas play. Have you ever seen it? I don't know what it is. Um, and I remember seeing kids on, on stage that were my age. I, I think I was 10. And I was with my friend, because my parents weren't taking us to the theater. My parents were both working their butts off because they had five kids, you know? And so I remember being there and thinking, well, how, did, how come they get to do that? Do, can I do that? And I remember going home and looking at the newspaper, the Weather Vane Theater in, you know, in Akron had a little audition column, and I said, Mom, I want to go audition for this community theater. And she was just like, oh, no, we're not doing that. You know, because she's, there's no time. There was no time. And so I put it away. And I remember I was waiting for soccer practice to start in high school, and I auditioned for the school play, and I got the lead in the school play my senior year in high school. That was my first play that I did. And then I went on to college at a small school in Ohio where I played soccer for four years. I was there for sports primarily. And like I said, I was an English and Spanish major. I changed majors like 10 times, but I settled <laughs> into English and Spanish and I studied abroad. It was a small school, so you could kind of do everything. And I think I did four or five plays in college. Um, and then when I was doing my thesis my senior year, my, my professor in college said, I think you could go to grad school for acting, which I, if I'm honest, I didn't even know people did that. You know, you grow up in Akron, Ohio, you don't hear about Juilliard, you don't hear about NYU. So I was like, huh. So I ended up going to Chicago to do the IRTA auditions, the university slash resident theater auditions, and my mom and my grandma and my aunts came with me and they basically just drank martinis in the Palmer house, <laughs> like got wasted. This fertilizer salesman from Japan bought us all steaks one night and my mom made me sing with the guy who's, who'd been playing piano at this bar for 40 years. I mean, it was crazy and so had nothing to do with grad school. Also, my monologues were awful. You know, I had done Imogen from Cymbeline and then something I can't remember, which is like Fat Best Friend. You know, it was a totally, it was just a weird time. It's a play no one's ever heard of. I don't even know what it was from. So the fact that Wisconsin took me was a miracle, but they admitted later, I mean, I was, I was their desperate last resort. It was a 10, 10, <laughs> I'm not even kidding. They will tell you this if they were sitting right next to me. I was so young, I had no experience, and at that time the economy was better, so people didn't go right into graduate school after undergrad. It's very common now. But at the time, I was the youngest or second youngest person in my class. All my classmates were like 10 or 12 years older than me. So there I was like 19, well, how old are you when you graduate college? Was I 21 or something, 20? Like yeah, I was in my 20s, or 20, 22. And here I am, I'm teaching kids at, in grad school, they're like my age, basically. They all kind of treated me like I was their mom anyway, but anyhow, I, I, sh I couldn't believe I got in anywhere. And, you know, and it was not great. It's not like I got a great education there. That The programs are always crazy. It's, they're always filled with crazy people losing their minds, you know, it's all academic, it's crazy. But I had like a great voice teacher, I had a great mentor, and I ended up getting an apprenticeship at the American Players Theater in Spring Green, Wisconsin. So I did outdoor Shakespeare in an 1100 seat house for four years, which was extraordinary. Yeah. I mean, in that time, whether it's in schooling or later, I mean, what kind of 
acting were you studying? I mean, were there specific styles that Goodness. really worked for you? We supposedly had an Asian movement focus. <laughs> It didn't really what does that pan mean? out. I don't know. <laughs> I learned to do a mie, which is like where you cross one eye but not the other. I remember that. I remember tying an obi. I learned that. I don't remember how to do that. There was a mask class. Um, so like all real applicable acting skills. Yeah. I did learn one good thing. My, I had a professor who was dying. My voice teacher's husband was dying of cancer, and he was an extraordinary actor out of Milwaukee, and he was teaching our Chekhov Shaw class, which was kind of great. And I remember we, you know, doing the scene. I was weeping. I was weeping, and he he had no time to waste. He just would cut, and we none of us wanted to work in front of him because he was so honest. It was really hard. And he looked at me and he said, "Dry it up, Carrie." I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "Dry it up. It doesn't matter if you cry. What matters is out there." He's like, "So it doesn't matter what's happening over here. It matters what's happening over there." And you may be enjoying this, you know, indulgence or whatever, but that's not the most important thing. And that was kind of when I started to understand why, you know, we did Virginia Woolf for two years. You don't always have it every day. You want to, but you don't always, and you have to have technique to get you through those times. And that it doesn't really matter how much you're feeling, actually. It just matters what it looks like. What it looks like you're feeling. So that was a really important lesson I learned in grad school. And IPA, I learned about IPA then. So, I mean, it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong, that a lot of sort of the skills that we see now on screen are things that were perhaps learned on the job. They were sort of innate. I mean, what were those years for you like working in all of those repertory companies and sort of figuring it out as you go? Well, as you, as you well know, theater and TV and film are quite different. I would say I, I started, so I was doing all theater. I had done a bunch of storefront stuff in Wisconsin and the, the Shakespeare, and I was transitioning to Chicago. I think I'd done two plays in Chicago before Virginia Woolf went to Broadway. So I, that was my third play in Chicago. So I did not come up through that storefront scene. But anyway, what I did get was, because the market in Chicago is smaller, I was able to get an agent right away. And they were sending me out on commercial auditions. And I was terrible for years. I went on so many commercial auditions. And I was just like, oh, you know, I, I thought, oh, you have to be really still, you know? Because that's what I thought it was to act on camera. Just like, you had to be really still and not move your face very much. <laughs> yeah, horrible. And so I eventually, because I went on so many commercial auditions, and a lot of them became sort of more improv-based, like there was this thing happening where they all wanted improv comedians in all their commercials. And I had never done any of that training, so I was like, okay, well, we'll just loosen it up. And I started booking commercials. So I, I actually learned to be on camera by doing all of those terrible commercial auditions and then doing commercials. And then I booked you know, a couple of guest star spots on TV. I did Playboy Club. Some of you may remember me from the Playboy Club. <laughs> um, and stuff like that. Right. Um, but it was really, I never took a class. We were not taught TV film acting in my grad school. It was a very research oriented school, actually. We wrote theses. Mm. And so all of that was learned in those terrible, terrible rooms where people talk about you like you're not standing right yeah. there. I always have to imagine that must be so strange Horrible. because you're there in like a myriad of clothing options and emotional ranges. I mean, it's horrible. So you don't enjoy the audition process is what I I'm mean hearing. you have to right. you have to accept the audition yeah. process and one thing I learned about the audition process is that Well, we all know that desperation does not a job get right and I remember um, You know going to a lot of theater auditions you, you usually have a scene partner that you're acting with and you get to play off of someone and those theater auditions are really useful because it's not different when you're doing an on-camera audition, but what the theater audition teaches you is that you can't walk into that room without a kind of love. It has to be an act of generosity. You have to embrace it as something that you are sharing with someone. Because if it's all about you and what you look like and how you're feeling, it's, you're not, that's never gonna work. And so this, I started to make a bit of a switch somewhere went in Chicago before I got the honey, um, before I got honey and who's afraid of Virginia Woolf, where I realized that I had to come in really open and available in those rooms, which is vulnerable. But it helps you relax if it's not about you. And that's, that's what acting is anyway. And nobody ever talks about, I, like nobody talked about that for me in the audition process, that it had to be about what's happening right there is actually what I'm trying to figure out. And so when you put that into the other person, then it's easier to audition. And so you can be present in those rooms the way you need to be. Now it's still weird because oftentimes TV and film, you're 
you know, like the Nora audition was a monologue. You know, it was her speech at the end of episode one. So it's not always that way, but it is about presenting yourself. And I think presencing myself has been the thing I've worked on then subsequently. So, it, so you, when you were doing all these plays, you were also auditioning for commercials. Sure. And I had read also, is it true that you were doing like motion capture work for yeah, video games? Yeah, I did that in Wisconsin, yeah. What is that like? So fun. <laughs> Look, those, they're all like, they're, they're all in their 30s, but they act like they're 10. It's always dudes, you know. And you go into this big room, and it was, one, it was a giant, um, you know, high ceiling studio with cameras, and I don't know how many cameras. I mean, there are many more cameras now. But you do, you put on the suit. They, got, they call me the B, because I had like a yellow and black suit. I think there's a picture out on the internet somewhere. And you get the balls everywhere. And, um, and you do, like you sort of calibrate the thing. You kind of do a couple runs and a couple specific movements we had to calibrate the cameras. And then you just kind of do whatever they need. So I would go from being kidnapped to being, you know, to like busting into a room with a gun to being like a spineless, you know, monster, whatever, in a day. And um, yeah, it was fun. It was really fun. As an actor, is there a freedom to being able to express all of that without, with knowing that your face is not going to be a part of the end result? You know, it's interesting. I never thought of it that way. I mean... My face, I'm sure it was, my face was doing what it was doing. It was probably crazy. But um, I found that I, as an athlete, I found that the headspace for being an athlete and being an actor is not different. Mm. I mean, it, what athletics demands of you is, a, is incredible presence in that moment, in your field vision or your race or whatever it is. And so that was familiar to me. So being in my body, I, I feel like I had, a, I had access to my body in a way that maybe some actors don't because, uh, because I was an athlete. Right. And so I had a real proprioception already. Um, and that helped me do the mocap work effectively because I could, you know, I could just, I had control over my body. Because some of it was real precise work. You had to sort of fit within a certain, you know, space. Like there are boxes on the floor and you have to kind of operate within a certain area. So you have to have a kind of physical precision. And I think physical precision is helpful. I think it helps tell a story. And I think the, the best storytellers, at least on stage, they're telling their story as equally with their physical bodies as they are with anything else. When they sit in a chair is like everything. And I think it teaches you that. I think the, I mean, the other thing I would imagine sports and theater work in particular have in common is endurance because mm. the amount of energy it must take to go through this journey eight times a week is similar to what it would, you know, I would imagine, not that I'm a sports person, but what I would imagine it must feel like to play a sport. Um, I mean, talk a little bit about sort of what you learned about the endurance necessary to sustain a theater run. Yeah, I suppose it, I suppose being an athlete prepared me to do that. What it teaches you is about, like, you have to train in order to win. <laughs> you know, you have to put the work in before you get to the race or the performance. And so I suppose rhythmically, it was the same. Right, there's a certain number of skills you're practicing, and then on the day you have to let go of all that stuff, and you have to be there in that moment, and that's all playing sports is. And so, yeah, I suppose the rhythm of that life is similar, but I hadn't thought of it that way quite. Well, I, um, um, with who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? That was sort of a very big undertaking. Yeah, boy, changed my whole life. I mean, I have to. Ask, I mean, is it one of those things? You know, on paper that role in such a production of it is also massive. You know, did, did it feel like, oh, this is gonna be a thing before you even gotten into it? The thing about Chicago is that um, Chicago tends to cast a year in advance, at least, in the theater scene, especially now that TV and film has moved in, they have to lock down their actors. So that what that meant as an actor in Chicago is that you would, when the theaters announced their seasons, you could look at all the seasons and you could see, oh, I'm good for three roles this year. You knew what was coming and you knew what could or could not be available to you. So I knew that Seven Wolf was doing Who's Afraid of Virginia Wolf, and that that was one of the only roles that season in any theater that I was eligible for. I think I was up, I think I had a good chance at two or three roles. Like in the whole city, you just kind of know what everyone's doing. So I knew I had to prepare for that. And I hadn't spent a lot of time with that play. I didn't know the play. We'd read it in undergrad, but I didn't remember. I didn't realize that's what I was reading because I didn't know who Edward Albee was in Ohio. I didn't know anything about that. So, um, so yeah, I knew, and, I, and you know, the preparation is everything. The preparation is everything. But I prepared really differently for that than I ever had. I, like I said, I was a, kind of a nerdy, I always do a lot of reading and I memorize, I do all those things. But I found myself really wanting to, um, uh, because Honey, because it was sort of the 60s, but really kind of more like the 50s, I, was, I found myself wanting to lounge around. I got a slip and I 
puttered around the house when my boyfriend was gone, and I even bought a little bit of brandy, and I didn't, you know, I didn't get drunk. I just, I don't really drink very much. So I would just take a couple sips, and I had some pearls, and I would, I would set my hair, and I would just kind of walk around the house. And I'd be sort of humming and be bored. And then knowing that my boyfriend was coming home, then I would sort of get dressed, you know? So I, di I actually did that a little bit, which I had never done before. And I don't know why I did it. I think it was because I watched um, the Uta Hagen video about playing drunk. It's on YouTube. And I was like, ooh, I gotta figure out how to play drunk because Honey is, you know, it's more about, it's about playing drunk. And she's got a great video where she talks about, it's not about showing you're drunk, it's about being very careful, right, to reveal that you're not. And so I think it came out of the fact that I knew I had to physically prepare that, that then the rest of the physical life became really critical. Also, something happened too in, in Chicago. A lot of the women who came in for that part came in like in jeans and flip-flops or something and like with their vocal fry, you know? You can't try out for a place that in the 60s when you're talking like this. <laughs> you're not gonna get that part. <laughs> so I think, you know, like a woman, if a woman comes into audition for Super and she's like, she's like, mm, hi, Nick. I was just like, mm, I don't know. And you can't sit like that, you can't. So it's like, I don't understand when actors don't, do like the minimum, which is like put on a skirt, get out your pantyhose, cross your legs, sit up straight, right? I mean, you have to know the decade you're playing. My husband had a play where the, the young women are in the, it's in the 60s, and they're at a Catholic school in the 60s. You would not believe these actors coming in and they're like, oh, oh my God, Mary Page, you must be so sad. I mean, it's just, it blows my <laughs> mind. Like, do some research, like, basic research. <laughs> Give yourself every advantage, it's hard enough. Oh, blows my mind. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I went no. off on a tangent. No, I was there for it, but I understand. <laughs> Thank you. Please work on your vocal fry. But I understand what you mean, because if you can't create the illusion in the room, yes. who's gonna think you can create the illusion on the day? That's right. That's right. It's so important. When you were talking about the Leftovers audition, you were talking about Nora and you had her speech. I mean, what was that audition process like? So Ellen Lewis, had, she's a great casting director in New York. One of the greats. She's from Chicago, actually. Big Cubs fan. That doesn't hurt. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, she saw Virginia Woolf. And so I was able then, I had transitioned from my agency in Chicago to an agency in New York. So I moved from Stuart Talent, which they were wonderful to me, but I ended up signing with Gersh when I got to New York on Broadway. So Gersh sent me in for a general with Ellen, and then a couple of weeks later she called me in to make a tape for Nora, which I did. Came in, you know, did a couple of scenes, and then the following, maybe it was a couple weeks later probably, I came in to have a meeting with Damon. And I expected to read or something, but it was just a chat. Damon just wanted to talk to me. And Damon and I had like a really, as I remember it, a very personal conversation about what it is to be a human being in the world, really. And it was really vulnerable and great. And he's so smart, you know, talking to him about the project was really interesting. And um, then I was warned by my agents, like that went very well, but now we gotta get network approval, you know? So everybody thought there were gonna be all these hoops to jump through and that I'd have to go to HBO and get, you know, yada 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 so t about 10 days later i got a call with an offer and, and everybody was really surprised but i think it was just a testament to damon's creative control in that process hbo wasn't he wasn't beholden to hbo for those decisions so he got to make them himself but i've never had to test for a pilot like i've never gone through that process so some of those things that are such hallmarks of this business i've never done which is kind of weird but well, I'm curious because that was really the first time you went from performing material almost cyclically, you know, over and over yeah. to something that was really a prolonged experience. What surprised you about sort of the differences in how you had to approach the material, not really knowing the destination? Well, what was what was interesting about what you say is that we shot the pilot in July or something, but I also I booked Gone Girl that same month, so I had made a tape in my living room in Chicago with. 18 pages of material and sent off this tape thinking no one is ever gonna watch this tape and I went to a wedding in New Orleans and I got this call they're like can you be in LA on Monday and I was like ah, I guess and I had I had taken you know two days worth of clothes to New Orleans and I ended up being in LA for a week because they wouldn't let me meet Fincher because of my schedule with HBO because we didn't know if the show was gonna get picked up all this stuff anyway what I'm trying to tell you is that I shot Gone Girl before I shot the season of Leftovers. So I went right to Gone Girl in August. We went down to Missouri. So I was working on a David Fincher movie where you do, you really do 50 takes. You do 27, you do 10, 
you never do less than five. If you get five, that's really good, but it's mostly in the 20 range when you're doing takes with David, and often in the 50s. But let me tell you, I also had never made a movie before. So I was like, I will do as many takes as you want, because I do not know what we're doing. <laughs> and I didn't know what we were doing, because David would say, he'd be like, I'm not getting enough screen direction. And I'm like, okay, okay. I had no idea what he was talking about. And I remember the, he, like, he, had me, he had me looking at this magazine. It was, like, it was like the first time I had a scene. We'd just been getting in and out of cars because that's basically what you do in film now is in and out of cars, <laughs> in and out of doors. So I was doing a lot of that for like a couple of weeks, which is a good warm up. And then I had to like, he's like, I need you to pick up the magazine. I need you to lift up your head, I need, but I need your chin to be, I was just like, you know, I was doing this horrible thing. And I heard him over by the monitors. He goes, you can't do it. And I was like, of course, devastated. I thought I was gonna get fired because you know, you do get fired off of David Fincher movies, you do. And so I remember I went to him the next day. He's, he probably doesn't even remember the story actually. And I said, David, you have to know, you know who you hired. You hired somebody who's never done this before and you have to help me because I do not understand what you're saying. But if I understand, I can do it. And he was like, yeah, okay. So he started to go, Carrie, come here. See the monitor? Okay, this is the shot, it's really tight. I need you to glide out on your right foot because you see what I'm doing here? I need you to really just glide out. I need you to shift your weight and then really smoothly. And he started to teach me things like that, which was amazing. And he was so lovely to me and we had a great time. And I, so I went to David Fincher school. So then I go to this television show and I'm on take three and I'm like, oh, okay, here we go. And they're like, okay, great, moving on. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, don't we have 20 more of these, you know? <laughs> Are we gonna do this all day? And they're like, no, 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 we gotta, we gotta go. <laughs> and I realized how fast it was. I'd never worked on TV like that. And really, if you look at that first season, I didn't work that much in the first five episodes. I had a couple of scenes. So I was still only working a day or two, so it was basically like doing a guest star spot. And then they gave me episode six, and I had never worked that many days in a row in my television life. And I was terrified. But, you know, I mean, somehow you do it. I have a million follow-up questions. <laughs> um, I, I want to, I, I'm curious, as an actor, mm -hmm. when you're in a situation where you're doing 50 takes, mm -hmm. are you trying to find small, subtle things to change? Or at that moment, are you just chasing what he wants? Well, I think, well, here's the thing, that you, first thing you have to understand is that it's not always about you. Right. And if you make it about you, you're gonna derail yourself because you're gonna start to feel insecure, right? And that is not, there's no room for that on that set. You have to show up like you belong there every day. So you can't make it about you. You'll know if it's about you <laughs> and you just have to keep trying. Yeah. So I, I don't think I was necessarily, probably because I was being careful in that process, I probably wasn't trying things as often. Like if I were to go back and make that movie now, I probably would be like, oh, the editor wants some options, you know? But I was just like, oh God, don't get fired. You know, I wasn't thinking of that. So, so yes, I mean, one of the things David was doing with that movie in particular, the tone was really critical. So he was making really subtle adjustments in tone. Just like, little more sarcastic, little less of this, little more, and he was doing that sometimes. And I, he was calibrating the film, right? Because he knew he'd have to dial those things up or down. So that was part of it. We just knew we had to give him those gradations. And he would usually tell you exactly what he needed. Otherwise, you know, you're, um, I forget what I was gonna say. No, it was important. Oh, what was I saying? David, uh, small changes, not about me. Oh, the thing is, David is also, he is trying to get people, he doesn't like a real actorly way, right? He is trying to wear you out. That's true. I think that's true about David. But what the other thing about David is though, even though it's about precision, he's also trying to force a mistake. He loves mistakes, which is, you don't expect that from somebody who's being so precise. But like, I remember a take where I, I had to answer the phone and I was like, <laughs> and, then I, and then I started laughing and he was like, no, that was, that was the one, you know? He really wants you to mess up. Because then you're not thinking about it. And actually the most interesting stuff happens when you make a mistake. So the misconception about David is that he's controlling when in fact he's actually looking for freedom. Um, I mean, I'm curious, when you, at this moment, get a script, whether it's for film or for television, just an original something, I mean, what are you looking at in the character options now? Like, what do you look for in a character you want to play? Well, the first thing I look for is the writing overall, being strong. My, my husband has a Pulitzer Prize. We're very snobby in our house about writing. So that, because if it's not there, it's probably not there. You're probably not gonna be able to make that. So first thing is the writing. The second thing is, does it ask something that I've not done before or that challenges me in a really specific way? Um, and you know, as an actress, that's hard to come by. 
because it's you know I'm getting a lot of like cops right I'm getting a lot of scripts you want to play a cop how about a grieving mom like that's the kind of stuff that's coming my way right now I'm like hmm you have no imagination um, <laughs> so you have to get past some of that stuff first but that's really so it's like it's like writing does it is it challenging to me and then then there's the third question which I hate to ask which is does it do something for me in terms of the, my career like what will this get net me in the future if I make this thing, does that mean I can go do the indie film that I want to do? Or, or does, do my parents need a house? Do I need to just make this blockbuster, buy my parents a house? You know, like that hasn't happened yet, but I'll let you know if that changes. <laughs> um, but you know, like what are, that's that third kind of mysterious piece of the puzzle. You hope you're going to make a decision that's purely artistic. I've, I've tried to. I think I'm very proud of my IMD page at this stage in my career, and I hope to stay that way. Um, but yeah, those are kind of the main criteria right now. And it's, I've said no to a lot of stuff. Well, I was gonna say, what are, I mean, on the converse, like what are the deal breakers, aside from terrible writing that you could never bring back into your home? I mean, what are the things that make you say like, get this away from Well, me? it's like, you know, the, the, you know exactly the roles, the trope, the trope roles of the, um, the put upon wife, the um, bitchy girlfriend who realizes at the end that he's just being hapless and I guess he's fine. You know, I, I mean, all that stuff that's been done a million times. Or, or like I said, if it's a grieving mom, it's like, you've seen me do it. Nobody needs to see me do that right now. Um, if it was a different angle of that, I'd consider it. Or if personally it comes up against something that I'm, I'm struggling with personally, maybe that would be interesting. But you know the roles I'm talking about. You see them every day. It's like everything you watch. In some ways, I think TV is pushing the conversation about what actresses can do faster than film, right? That, that middle level of film is gone. We don't have it anymore. TV is really rushed in to make these 10-hour movies, and I think it's opening opportunity for actresses right now. Like, uh, 10 years ago, somebody my age, is, I feel like, like my career would be over already. I mean, I'm 36 years old. I'm already playing 40, so there's that. I think I got a script the other day for somebody who's 50. I was like, okay, so we're pushing it. That's fine. I don't get, I don't get Botox or anything, so I guess aging gracefully is not something that's valued. But anyway, you know, it's, it's that. You, you just play the same thing. Over. Like, I'll be playing, like, people's aunts in, like, five minutes. That's bizarre. It's true. I, no, I'm it's just not. true. But I can go back to the theater. <laughs> Do you? When it's so, when theater is so like deep in your bones, when you've been gone for a while, do you find yourself missing it? Oh yeah, yes, of course. Because, look, in TV, in, in the TV and film world, there's somebody else telling you when they got it, when you're done, right? We got that. We're moving on. Oh, okay, good. Oh, do you want me to do it another way? You know, there's this kind of. Um, you, you're not the one making that determination, nor are you the one choosing the final product. That's the editor's job. You have no control over that. But when you're on stage, either in rehearsal and then when you're performing that thing every night, you are the arbiter of taste. That's your decision. And you're the one who has to gauge how impactful you're being in that moment. And you get to keep in touch with that voice, which I think is really important when you're making decisions about the work you want to do and also just your taste level when you're working. If you lose track of that for yourself and you're relying on other people to tell you what's good, then you're, I think you're going to lose your way a little bit. Um, so I think it's important. Uh, question from Ryan. And Ryan. it's sort of something we're talking to a little bit now and have already. The idea of preparing to audition for an on-camera role versus preparing to audition for a theatrical role. I mean, do you find that there needs to be a difference in the way you audition for those two mediums? I mean, I think actually most theater auditions I've been on the room is actually pretty intimate so I don't actually think they're very different um, I think you should be mindful you could probably get away with more bad habits in a TV film audition honestly because you can it, it's it is smaller I think it should be smaller usually there's a camera on you right and in a theater room you could probably move around and do that stuff but I don't think the preparation is different know your lines you know know your lines so you cannot think about them be really present I think it's the same. In a theater audition, if you know that you're auditioning for a place that's gonna have a big old theater, you have to prove that you, can, you have the, you know, especially as a woman, you gotta have the voice to back it up. Because if they don't think you can fill a room, then you're not gonna get that job. But no, I think it's the same. I think learn your lines and, and then be available to the person you're acting with. I think that's it. Laurel was wondering how you got your SAG card. Oh my gosh, I think it was on, oh my gosh. I think it was on this um, national commercial. Would that be, yeah, right? Oh, you guys, I apologize deeply. It was, it was pro high fructose corn syrup. <laughs> it's a thing, you probably saw it. I'm in a cornfield, I'm like, sugar is sugar. Your body can't tell the difference. It's, <laughs> it's still on the internet. 
Because some somebody some some jerky person posted it on my Twitter like six months ago. I was like, "Do you still believe this, Carrie Coon?" And I was like, <laughs> "Okay." To be fair, I was broke. You know, it was in Decatur, Illinois. My car died in Decatur, Illinois. So I had to buy a new car when it was over. I mean, I had this crazy experience in Decatur. It was 115 degrees. It was the worst weekend ever. But it was, but I got a lot of money. <laughs> it was a national commercial. You know, I was thrilled, but it really did has come back to haunt me because it was, I don't eat high fructose corn syrup. I didn't then and I don't now. But I'm just like, it's fine. It was terrible. That has got to be the strangest thing that actors in t who are working today have to deal with, like the way social media has changed the longevity of projects you wish never saw the light of day. <laughs> yeah, it, it changes everything. I mean, there are entire wings of agencies devoted to YouTube stars. I asked my nephew what, he, what he wanted to be when he grew up the other day, and he said he wanted to be a YouTube star. And I was like, that is not a real job. Also, you have no charisma. <laughs> I'm sorry. He's a lovely young person. He's not going to be a YouTube star. Sometimes somebody, somebody needs to be honest with you about that. So <laughs> it's really, you're seeing the other side. Um, yeah, I mean, no, it's horrible. Because like nowadays, like the only way you get on like late night to promote a show is your social media matrix. Or, or if somebody says to me, you know, Carrie, your brand. I'm like, don't, we don't use the word brand. I'm like, nobody uses the word brand. I'm not a brand. I just find it all really off-putting. I feel so old-fashioned. But I, and also, you know, I have gotten on the Twitter now and I'm, I'm on the Instagram, I'm trying. But like the Twitter stuff is, is I, I can't help be political on it too. And so now there's this whole other side of like, you know, people are like, I used to watch your show, but now I know you're a liberal and I hate you. And you're like, okay, well, so, see ya. I mean, well, I don't care. I mean, it's just so strange and what people feel like they can say to you. Or this is my favorite. <laughs> my husband and I sometimes read mean tweets out loud. We don't get a lot of them, we're not that popular. But like every now and then there'll be one that's like, for some strange reason, I'm really attracted to Carrie Coon. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's so mean. It is amazing what people feel comfortable saying yeah. to other like human beings Yeah, on I mean, I, my husband would just, Annette O'Toole was in his play. Annette O'Toole, gorgeous, stunning, amazing Annette O'Toole. And she's, you know, in her 60s now. And she's, she's letting herself age beautifully. And I remember somebody came up to her at dinner and said, did you used to be Onet O'Toole? <laughs> like, did you used to be? I mean, it's just amazing what people will say. Anyway, I think it's all weird. I don't like doing it. Well, you're good at it, though. It's oh, hard. thanks. I'm trying. I am trying. They make me try. Do, do <laughs> I went to social media boot camp. <laughs> What is that? What is it's that where they're mean? like, if you're posting once a day, you can post twice. Is Brenna in here right now watching this? <laughs> <laughs> they're like, you know, pick three things that you like. You know, books, Carrie. You can post about books. <laughs> so it's like that. It's very sweet. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, you're speaking to an interesting idea of you, you called yourself sort of like an old-fashioned mm -hmm. star. I mean, and I think that's very true. I mean, I even think the the projects on television you've been successful in are not traditional television shows. I mean, The Leftovers, yeah, yeah. Fargo. I mean, what is it about these sort of left of center stories that really speak to you? I guess I'm a little off. Um, I, I don't know, I just don't wanna do anything that's not good. So I was fortunate that something really great came to me in The Leftovers. And that what followed that was Fargo was just kind of, I still can't believe it. I still think they're gonna be like, it was, we were kidding. That's actually not the season. Um, it, it feels surreal to me. But I, I do think you sort of get out, you kind of get back what you put in, right? And I, I'm, I love ambiguity in my art. We are so trained to expect everything to be knit up nicely for us at the end. And in fact, our lives are, are not like that at all. And I like art that reminds me of the way my life feels. And, and that's what I like about The Leftovers and that's what I like about Fargo. I love that those men are comfortable with that kind of ambiguity because it's everywhere. I mean, I just don't have definitive answers for anything. And so I'm comfortable with it and I love it. And maybe that's the thing people respond to in me as a kind of you know, comfort with that, um, with the unknowing. Because I don't know anything. You were a huge fan of the film, correct? Of, uh, of Fargo? Fargo? Oh, sure. I mean, who wasn't? It, now it's like, it was like 20 years ago. When was it? It's 96, was it like, Oh my right? God. I know. Yeah, I guess I was. I don't know. I was like 10. I wasn't 10, but. Because I, 
there is something strange too I find with the people who get to wear like the iconic Fargo like the hat it's terrifying and the, it's, why well because it's Francis McDormand if Francis McDormand walked in here right now I would not be able to speak and that's saying something because clearly I don't have trouble with that <laughs> I mean, so you just have to sort of just like grin bear. You can't. I mean, it was the same with Virginia Woolf. Like if you approach it like we're doing a classic play, you're screwed before you start. You have to approach everything like it's new. And in fact, you know, with a good writer like Noah, there's enough difference in Gloria, even though it's a a trope of that series. um, He puts her in such a different emotional space than those other women. You know, she doesn't have that same alacrity. She's not upbeat in the way they are. She's just been kind of beaten down and she's a little bit impatient. She doesn't have the... She can't muster the Minnesota nice right now. She's really having a hard time with that. And I think that's so genius because it's not the same person. But it's a terrifying legacy, of course. And you know you're going to be compared to, you know, to Francis, to Alison Tolman, also just to, the, you know, to Kirsten and all the women from the previous season. But how great that we have the chance to even be compared to each other. That those roles are even on TV. Yeah. So well, sort of in closing, Carrie, I mean, I never want to leave the stage and I want to stay up here forever. Um, But you do have a room of actors, you know, and I'm curious uh, if there is a piece of advice you feel like you wish you knew Mm. at the outset of this career that you know now that you would like to Oh, I mean, I can share some advice that has helped me that I got when I was younger that has helped me a lot. And you've heard it before, so it's going to be boring for you. I was doing um, Our Town with Andre De Shields, a fantastic actor, song and dance man. You all know Andre, I hope. And he was playing the stage manager. And I asked him that. I said, what advice would you give me? You know, I was in grad school and I was just about to embark on my career. That was my first professional play. And he said, other people's blessings. And I was like, what do you mean? And he said, if, if you go out for something and you don't get it, it's not yours. That was somebody else's blessing. And yours is coming, you just don't know what it is or what it looks like, but it's coming your way. And it's a simple thing, but I actually think that shift is super critical if you want to stay in this business for any length of time, because what it affords you is space to be generous with people who, are, who you're up against. And I'm up against some amazing people in my career right now. The list of women that are now, that I'm like up against for jobs has, got, has just gotten worse. <laughs> I mean, you know how many people have to die for me to be number one on that list? Like, so <laughs> many women have to die. Um, so I'm like number 12 or something. You know, everybody has to die. So um, you cannot move through this world because, because, again, the artistic process is a generous one. And when you lose that, you cannot, I think, be present in your art in a way that's going to get you a job. You just become very small. And you can't be genuinely grateful or, or, or you can't be genu- genuinely happy for your peers. And that's, nothing good comes of it. Beca- you just have to let it go. You got to learn to let it go. Because it's not about you. There's so many things you can't control. And everybody always says that to us in clinics, right? Like, well, you just can't control everything. But here are the things you can control. You know, it's always about that. But I just think there's no other way to move through this. There's just no other way. It's other people's blessings. And that's, that's everything spirit of generosity Mm -hmm. yeah i mean bring your love in the room just bring your love in that's the only way well thank you for bringing your love here today carrie this was so wonderful thank you you to all of you so sweet thank you have a nice afternoon